transtrapezial approach for fixation of acute scaphoid fractures. A video that demonstrates the excellent technique. The usual mechanism of injury is a fall onto the outstretched hand, foosh, that results in forceful dorsiflexion and impaction of the scaphoid against the dorsal rim of the radius. This mechanism explains why snuffbox tenderness is so common, even in the absence of a scaphoid fracture. An acute undisplaced scaphoid waist fracture in a young active patient is the primary indication for this procedure as an alternative to cast immobilization. Delayed union or non-union of the scaphoid waist, when no marked cyst formation, 5 mm, sclerosis, or deformity is present on radiographs or computed tomography scans. Displaced waist fractures need to be reduced first, before a percutaneous screw can be inserted. The distal fragment is most commonly displaced into flexion and pronation in relation to the proximal fragment. Manipulating the wrist into extension and supination often corrects minor displacement or gap formation. If necessary, Kirschner wires can be used as joysticks in the distal fragment, inserted from a volar approach and or proximal fragment, inserted from a dorsal approach, to help reduce the displaced fragment. Arthroscopy is the ideal modality to confirm accurate reduction of the fracture fragments when necessary. Fractures in the very proximal part of the scaphoid can more accurately be reduced and fixed using a dorsal approach. Displaced fractures that cannot be reduced into a satisfactory position, often part of a perilunate injury pattern, need to be managed through an open approach. A long-standing non-union with sclerosis and or deformity is better addressed through an open approach with bone grafting and correction of the deformity. The transtrapezial approach for fixation of acute scaphoid fractures facilitates precise percutaneous placement of a screw along the central axis of the scaphoid, which has been shown to be biomechanically superior to a more eccentric screw position. The transtrapezial approach provides access to the central axis of the scaphoid and turns a technically demanding procedure into a straightforward operation if all steps are followed. Correct positioning of the patient, surgeon, and fluoroscopy equipment is essential before starting the procedure. The central axis of the scaphoid is marked on the skin, both in the frontal and the lateral plane. A volar stab incision is made over the distal part of the trapezium, and a guide wire is inserted through the trapezium along the central axis of the scaphoid, parallel to the skin markings, under visual control and fluoroscopic control. The trapezium and the distal cortex of the scaphoid are drilled. The length of the scaphoid is measured, and the appropriate screw is selected and inserted. Step 1. Position the patient, surgeon, and fluoroscopy equipment. Position the patient supine with the affected arm on an arm table. Assuming that the surgeon is right-handed, he or she sits in the axilla of the patient for a left scaphoid procedure or at the shoulder and head of the patient for a right scaphoid procedure. This facilitates insertion of the guide wire and more intuitive handling of the other instruments. Place the fluoroscopy tube, mini C-arm or dedicated C-arm, on the opposite side of the surgeon. Position the monitor in front of the surgeon or on the opposite side of the patient and so that it is easily visible to the surgeon. Adjust the fluoroscopy image on the monitor, rotation and mirroring, so that it is oriented exactly as the limb of the patient is oriented in front of the surgeon. Step 2. Mark the skin. The central axis of the scaphoid on the skin along the frontal and lateral, optional, planes as the markings allow visual control for insertion of the guide wire. Position a guide wire on the skin of the patient along the central axis of the scaphoid in the frontal and lateral, optional, planes, figure. Mark the position of the guide wire on the skin to provide a visual mark for guide wire insertion, figure. Step 2, mark the skin. The central axis of the scaphoid on the skin along the frontal and lateral, optional, planes as the markings allow visual control for insertion of the guide wire. Position a guide wire on the skin of the patient along the central axis of the scaphoid in the frontal and lateral, optional, planes, figure. Mark the position of the guide wire on the skin to provide a visual mark for guide wire insertion, figure. Step 3, Stab Incision. Make a volar stab incision at the intersection of the lines. Step 4, Insert the guide wire. Insert the guide wire through the trapezium along the central axis of the scaphoid, which is the critical step of the procedure. 
The preferred starting point for guide wire insertion is the center of the volar cortex of the trapezium. Insert a 1.1 mm guide wire, for later placement of a 2.0 mm headless bone screw, into the trapezium using the skin markings as a visual guide. Use fluoroscopy control to confirm the good position of the guide wire. Ontario posterior fluoroscopic image is showing the wrist in the neutral position. As long as the guide wire is not advanced into the scaphoid, adjust the direction of the guide wire further, if needed, by changing the position of the wrist, radial and ulnar deviation or flexion and extension. This helps to position the guide wire exactly along the central axis of the scaphoid. Figures. Ontario posterior fluoroscopic image is showing the wrist in the neutral position, radial and ulnar deviation. Step 4, insert the guide wire. As long as the guide wire is not advanced into the scaphoid, adjust the direction of the guide wire further, if needed, by changing the position of the wrist, radial and ulnar deviation or flexion and extension. This helps to position the guide wire exactly along the central axis of the scaphoid. Figures. Lateral fluoroscopic image is showing the wrist in neutral position, flexion and extension. Advance the guide wire further until it abuts on the proximal cortex of the scaphoid figure. It is advisable to use a smooth, rather than a threaded, guide wire as this allows the surgeon to feel resistance when the wire abuts on the proximal cortex of the scaphoid. Carefully check the correct position of the guide wire under fluoroscopy in all planes. See figures. The position of the guide wire on a lateral view and oblique view. Figures. Drilling. Drill the trapezium and the distal cortex of the scaphoid to allow easy insertion of the screw. With a 2.0 mm cannulated drill bit, drill the trapezium and the distal cortex of the scaphoid. Figure. When self-drilling is used, it is unnecessary to drill the whole scaphoid. This will avoid backing out of the guide wire when the drill is retracted. Step 6. Length measurement. Determine the correct length of the screw to be inserted by sliding a length measurement device with an arrow tip over the guide wire until it reaches the distal cortex of the scaphoid. Figure. Check the position of the length measurement device tip under fluoroscopic control and decide on the appropriate screw length. Figure. If the appropriate length measurement device is not available, the correct length can also be determined by an alternative technique. Pass a second guide wire of similar length in the pre-drilled trajectory along the first guide wire until it reaches the distal cortex of the scaphoid. Measure the difference in length between the two guide wires, which is the length of the screw to be inserted. Insert a screw of maximum length with purchase of the screw threads into the strong subchondral bone, as this provides the most rigid fixation, which is the goal. However, protrusion of the screw definitely needs to be avoided. It is therefore advisable to subtract 2 to 4 mm of the total measured scaphoid length when deciding on the length of the screw. It is advisable to use screws that are available in 1 mm length increments, as this facilitates the insertion of a screw with the ideal length. Insert the selected screw over the guide wire. Insert the selected screw over the guide wire into the correct position, along the central axis of the scaphoid. Figure. Use careful fluoroscopic control which is necessary to avoid protrusion of the screw both proximally at the radiocarpal joint and distally at the scaphotrapezial joint. Protrusion of the screw into the scaphotrapezial joint is best checked on a 45 degrees pronated oblique view with the wrist in slight flexion and ulnar deviation, figure. Insert the selected screw over the guide wire. When the screw protrudes outside the scaphoid, a grinding sensation can often be felt when the wrist is mobilized. The technique allows exact central placement of the screw into the scaphoid, figure. Pitfalls and challenges. To allow early mobilization and return to function, it is essential that the screw is correctly positioned into the scaphoid, which is technically challenging but facilitated by the transtrapezial technique. Protrusion of the screw at the radiocarpal or scaphotrapezial joint needs to be avoided at all times, as it may cause pain, loss of function, and degenerative changes at longer term. Choosing a screw of appropriate length and careful fluoroscopic evaluation of the radiocarpal and scaphotrapezial joint in all planes are necessary. Therefore, we routinely use the 45 degrees pronated oblique view to evaluate the scaphotrapezial joint.
Thanks for watching my video. Do not forget to subscribe my non-profit YouTube channel.